Hello, everyone. Welcome to MSG's webinar series, our Educate, Empower, and Equip webinar series for December. We're so glad that you could join us today. Uh, my name is Kathy, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the CEO of Mustard Seed Generation. We are a nonprofit dedicated to creating spaces like what you've seen just before um, to really normalize mental health in the Korean American community and create it and really create bicultural and bilingual spaces like tonight. Um, so today I'm super excited um, to share with you um, our series that's going to really launch about connecting with children, talking to kids about change. Um, so with that said, I do want to share that we have live translations happening tonight. And so for those of you tuning in, um, if you would like to see Korean subtitles, you will need to click on the closed caption button as you see on the bottom of your screen. And once you click that, and you'll be able to see the Korean translations taking place. And I just wanna give a big shout out to our transla translators in the background that you might not see right now. So big shout out to Chorong, Chiwon, and Young who are very uh, fast at work doing translations so that we can all tune in together as a family. So with that said, I do want to share again that we want to create spaces um, like this where we can continue to converse together. And so with that said, we would love for you to input any questions that you have into the Q&A box. You actually have two ways to interact with us. One is through the chat box, which you could share any things that resonate with you. Please feel free to add to the chat box. If you know um, author David, feel free to say hi in the chat box and give a shout out. But if you do have specific questions for the author tonight, we ask that you put it into the Q&A box so that we can get to it towards the end of our fireside chat today. And without further ado, I would love to welcome now author David Kim, David Changyan Kim on screen, if he could turn on his camera. We're so excited and honored to have him. Hi, David. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Just Good to be here. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. Um, just as a quick intro, he is the author of this wonderful book here that we're going to talk about, A Kid's Book About Change. Um, he graduated with his Master's of Divinity as well as his Master's of Theology at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary out in Massachusetts. However, right now he is in California as a discipleship pastor at Westgate Church. I think he is very uh, well versed in change considering that he hopped from coast to coast. And currently he is um, serving at that church and he is husband to wife Nina and father to his two girls, Skylar and Zoe. So we're so glad to have you, David. Um, there's gonna be a lot to talk about just looking at your background, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, Boston was too cold. So um, <laughs> for those who know, you know, I, I needed to get out of there. <laughs> I don't blame you. I moved from, Philadelphia to Texas too. So we're definitely moving towards the warmer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we would love to get to know more about you all who are tuning in. So right now you'll see a poll question uh, pop up on your screen, really asking you all where you are specifically tuning in from. So are you also from where we came from, which is the Northeast? Or are you coming from the Southeast, Northwest, Southwest, Midwest? Central, um, maybe you're also tuning in from Texas, uh, South, as well as outside the US. And so if you could take a minute to indicate in the poll where you're tuning in from, that would be great. And while we're doing that, uh, David, California is really, really big. Where in California are you tuning in from? Yeah, I'm in Silicon Valley, San Jose, and um, it's yeah, it's nice. It's about 60, 65 right now. So um, enjoying the weather. That's awesome. Great. Well, let's look at our results. Wow, we have a lot of people from the Northeast. So hopefully you all are bundled up <laughs> and staying warm out there. It's great to see representation for from all of the options, actually. And we have several tuning in from outside the U.S. So a big shout out uh, to those tuning in from outside of the U.S. as well. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, we go to the next question. Uh, we, this next question is not a poll question. It is actually a question that David had asked me when we first chatted, and I thought it was a great question to ask our poll um, in our poll. And you could answer this in the chat box. Uh, and that question is, what's the most pleasant change you've experienced in 2020? 
And David, I know when you ask this question, so feel free right now, if you're in the audience, um, write that in the chat box, share with us, what is that most pleasant change you've experienced in 2020? If there's multiple, feel free to indicate that. I'm seeing everything from clearer skies and more family time. I get to be a true introvert, yes, to the introverts out there. Keep being able to work from home and enjoy more time with family, getting engaged. <laughs> oh, really? Me too. <laughs> uh, rekindle connections. First baby. There's a lot of change. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. Promotion. Congratulations. That's amazing. David, how about you? I actually really love when you ask this question because I think we often hear, you know, 2020 was so difficult and so hard that I think it's easy to just kind of think about the negatives, but I loved when you asked, like, what is that pleasant change? So could I ask you what the most pleasant change for you has been? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everyone. Spending more, more time with family definitely is up there. Um, I would say for me, uh, along with that, Silicon Valley, because it's such a fast pace. I mean, change is part of what Silicon Valley is, right? Startups everywhere. And there's a ton of traffic. Everything's always crowded. And all of a sudden, just slow down. And for me, just slowing down, that changed the pace of the way we uh, pay attention to certain things and things like that. And so for me, I found that incredibly helpful as I connect with family and connect with God and connect with others. That's awesome. Thank you. This is so great. Well, thank you everyone to, um, for participating in our chat box. I hope you continue to engage with us. Again, please feel free to utilize the Q&A portion. I'm sure you all might have some great questions for David. So I'm going to actually now stop sharing my screen so everyone can see your face, David. Um, and I would love to kind of pick your brain because you have multiple roles. You are not just an author, as we see here, but you are also a pastor. You are a father, um, also an Enneagram coach for people who might not know. I would love to ask you, you know, how has this pandemic personally and maybe even professionally impacted you? Yeah, so uh, for me, definitely, our church, uh, Westgate Church is a mega church. And so, you know, three, 4,000 members here. And so when things have slowed down, it was a busy ministry, busy church. And so we got to really reassess how we're doing as a church. And have we spent more energy on just our weekend experience? And how are we actually discipling our, our people and, and coming alongside? And so there's yeah a lot of reassessment, I guess, for my professional life and the way we serve our community. But yeah, uh, Enneagram coaching, uh, for those who know, uh, it has picked up a lot for me because a lot of uh, companies and organizations, there's a lot of stress, anxiety, uncertainty about the future. And so uh, just a lot of um, work that needs to be done in terms of how they navigate their own emotions and stress at work and how they become more self-aware and, and others aware in the way they navigate just some of the things that are going on in our world today. And so I've been it slowed down in term, in certain ways, but got really busy with all sorts of uh, navigating tensions in relationships and so forth. I bet. And I think that's such a great segue into even just why this book came about. Like we're spending more time with our families to your point about, you know, churches thinking about the weekends where families are spending more time together. Um, I'm curious, people are super curious about, and I'm curious about this too, the fact that, you know, you're a pastor, you're an Enneagram coach, how did you get to writing this book in particular? Like, was being a children's book author something that you always had in mind? How did that happen? Absolutely not. <laughs> I never thought I would write a children's book. I've been a youth, I've been in Korean American youth ministry for 11 years. And so, and uh, I, I have left that as well. I couldn't do any more lock-ins or pizza nights. If you know, you know, right? Uh, <laughs> and, um, and children's ministry, definitely, I, I, it's, it's, and, and children's work, uh, something, I have two girls, but it's not something that I was thinking about, but what ended up happening is, um, I ended up preaching a couple years ago on just my journey of faith and some of the things and habits and addictions that I struggled in the past and currently am, and my church was pretty gracious in, in allowing me to share those things. 
And as a pastor, especially growing up in an Asian American, Korean American church, that was a very foreign thing because, you know, I thought I would get fired or my, but church was very gracious in opening that. And so as I shared that story, um, it became viral. And I think it became viral, not because it was something that I said that was really profound, but as a Korean pastor talking about some of the things, I think it really hit home with a lot of folks. And it ended up being uh, watched by the CEO of our publisher. And he said, that's a kid's book uh, about change. And so um, he contacted me and then we started working on it. And, and um, there you go. Uh, so it's just a, <laughs> yeah, uh, experience that I wasn't planning. But, you know, as we follow Jesus, that's kind of the thing, right? Um, a lot of times uh, we have our own ways and plans, but just God has something else for us. And it's always a wonderful surprise. That is amazing. And I think it's, it speaks to the power of vulnerability. You never know who's going to be watching, right? Or who's going to be contact you for, or contacting you for an opportunity to share on like a, a, a really big platform, especially for kids too. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that. I think we're seeing a lot of um, Action, interaction in our chat box. I don't know if you've been noticing a lot of people are talking about lock-ins, anagrams, so clearly everything that you're saying is really resonating with our community here. But um, I know people are really wondering um, what this book is about, and I know that you graciously agreed to share this book with us. So if you could actually um, get ready to start your screen, and uh, for all of you who are attending right now, you're really in for a treat. Uh, David had actually agreed to share the entire book. So I'm gonna give you a couple seconds right now. If your maybe child is um, not wanting to go to bed or is in the other room, bring them over <laughs> and get ready for a great story hour that's gonna happen right now. So David, if you're ready, I'm gonna turn off so you could take it away. Yeah, can you guys all see this? Am I good to go? It looks great. Great. Uh, so here it goes. A Kid's Book About Change by David Kim. Um, so I dedicated uh, my book uh, for Skylar. She is five, Zoe for my daughters. Skylar and Zoe. And the reason why I um, dedicated this book to my girls is this is the book that I wish I had growing up as I was navigating my immigrant journey. And so I wanted to make sure that they had some kind of a resource. And so with that um, intro, so the intro and the outro is for the parents. And so basically the premise of the book or the publisher is that um, the, there are many important and difficult topics that every parent must talk about with their children. And so the intro and the outro is there for the parents to just prepare themselves as they read the story to the kids and have honest and thoughtful conversations. So intro and the outro is there to equip the parents. So let me read that for you. You may be wondering why we should talk about change. Well, change happens all around us. We experience it every day. It's a big part of life. Every change comes with a loss and the birth of something new. If you move from one city to another, this change comes with the loss of seeing old friends, but also the gaining of new ones. If we do, don't give our kids opportunities to explore and process change, their fears and frustrations could come out in unhealthy patterns, such as acting out or shutting down. And there are changes that are certainly worth pausing for and celebrating. And this acknowledgement can be so meaningful to kids. I hope this book will provide a space for families to slow down and address any questions and uncertainties around change. Hi, my name is David. I probably haven't met you, but well, now we've met, but I know for a fact that I have something in common with you. Do you know what that is? Change. That's right. I wish I could flip the book. Uh, change is something that happens to everyone, no matter how old you are, where you live, or what you do. Don't forget to flip the book back. When I was 10 years old, I moved from my home in Korea to New York City in America. This meant a lot of changes, like language. In Korea, hello looked like this, annyeong. But in America, hello looked like this, hello. 
food in Korea, lunch looked like this. But in America, lunch looked like this. Friends back home, friends had names like this. Eunhae, Minjun, Gwanu, Taeun. But in America, friends had names like this. John, Ashley, James, Grace, and Emma. To be honest, so many things changed when I moved that I can't even remember all of them. Even though change is something we all experience, we don't really talk about change a lot, do we? Change is something that happens so much, we sometimes don't even notice it's happening. Sometimes change is something you choose, like what you will wear, who your friends are, or, or what to read. But more often, change is something that happens to you, like moving, like what school you go to, or getting sick. Change can be really hard to describe and understand. But if I had to say what change was exactly, I'd say change is when something becomes different. When something goes from being one thing to another. Try reading that one more time. Change is when something becomes different. When something goes from being one thing to another. Because so much change happened in my life. All at once. I was scared. After the first week of school, I didn't want to go back because I didn't have any friends. I would sometimes eat my lunch in the bathroom. That way, I wouldn't have to sit alone in the cafeteria. Some of my classmates would make fun of the smell of my Korean food. They would hold their nose. I, I, I remember visually it. So I started eating bagels and pizza for the first time. This change wasn't so bad because I ended up liking bagels and pizza, but it, was, it still wasn't easy. Remember, I was in New York City. So New York pizza and bagels, amazing, by the way. But let me continue. Oh, I miss bagels and pizza. Okay, Jesus, help me. Okay. All right, so some of my classmates couldn't pronounce my Korean name. Try pronouncing that. And many people had different variations of that. They laughed while pronouncing it, and I was embarrassed. But it's actually pronounced Chang Hyun, by the way. But, you know, people would say Jang or Jang Hyun, right? All sorts of... Uh, ways in which they would uh, try to pronounce uh, my name. So I gave myself an English name that would be easier for them to say. I told everyone just one day to call me David. Can you imagine changing your name when you're 10 years old? It seemed like everyone wanted to change who I was and what I like to fit in. I wasn't sure where my place was in this new life. Let's talk about you. What's something that has changed in your life recently? Maybe it was moving to a new desk in your class, or maybe it was moving to a new city like me. When that change happened, were you scared, excited, overwhelmed, happy, surprised, angry, sad, disappointed, or not sure what to feel? It's not just you. Change can be really hard, especially an unexpected change because you're taken by surprise. And even when that something is good, it can be scary to leave the old thing behind, mostly because you'll miss it. Now, when change happens, we usually do one of three things. Number one, we resist change by fighting back. I told my parents I hated school and never wanted to go back. Sometimes I would lie and, and, um, and tell them that I had a stomach ache so that I wouldn't have to face all of the changes. Or number two, we ignore change by acting like nothing happened. I didn't share how I really felt. I just went in and out of life. Actually, I played a lot of video games to just ignore uh, back then, uh, uh, StarCraft, Counter-Strike, I don't know if anyone can relate, but those were the games that I played a lot. Um, 
but let me move on. Uh, but neither of these will make the change any better. I suggest we, number three, embrace change. That's what I decided to do eventually. I made friends, but still kept in touch with all, all my friends in Korea. I started eating pizza and bagels, but still enjoyed my galbi and kimchi at home. I embraced my new name, but was still okay being called Changhyun. And do you know what can make change easier? When you can talk about it and have someone listen. For me, this was my teacher, Ms. Stratuli. I remember her patiently and kindly answering my questions. I also remember her labeling each item in the class in both Korean and English just for me. I'm going to say this uh, at the end, but this is really important for me. It made me feel known and cared for. So when change happens, what should you do? Find someone that is a good listener and tell them about the change and how you feel about it. It might be your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, or coaches, right? Find someone who's a good listener, uh, someone who's safe. It's really okay to talk about change. You can start by saying things like, I am worried about, I am scared to, I am excited because I am looking forward to. It's also okay to ask for help in dealing with change. All you have to say is, I need help with. I need help with. Just recognizing it and talking about it may seem small, but it can have a huge impact. And remember, change is something that happens to everyone. You are not alone. So can you think of any changes that you would like to talk about? Why not start right now? Outro, understanding and navigating change is difficult for children and grown-ups alike, but it's inevitable and we don't have to go through it alone. Here are three suggestions for navigating change. Number one, talk about a recent change, grown-ups, that has affected you personally. How did you feel? How did you cope with it? What did you learn? Allow your kids to see that it's okay and safe to process change and the emotions that come with it. I think this is really important, grown-ups, to uh, model that first in your life. You don't have to wait until you've figured it all out. I think this is really important. Number two, sometimes your kids might not want to talk about change, and that's okay. Just remind them that you're available to talk about it and answer any of their questions when they are ready. Number three, when your kids do decide to share, it's important to not underreact or overreact. When you respond in this way, you are dismissing their experience and feelings and you're taking it upon yourself. Instead of reacting, respond with empathy. And so here are some ways you can navigate change. And so I'm gonna stop sharing here. And I said, I'm gonna go back. Um, and a couple things that I wanna uh, remind. Number one is that for some folks, um, what may be a small change for some might be a big change for someone else. And so we have to be really kind because it's not about how you feel about the change. It's always about how each and every person feels about the change. And so I said, Ms. Stratuli, this is 25 years ago. What she would do is she would... Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but what she would do is she would have all of the students just draw some of the things in the classroom and she would ask them to write it in English and for me to write it in Korean. And we would have this posted all throughout the classroom. And she did this just for me for the entire school year. And I have, and she gave me this. I mean, there's about hundred pages here, right? And, and, and she gave me this as a gift when I finished my school year. And I moved 22 times across the country, 22 times in the last 25 years. And I've Marie Kondo'd everything, right? <laughs> I had to throw away a ton of stuff. 
But in 22 times, every time I had to figure out whether I'm going to throw it away, I would look at this binder and I kept it. If you are an educator or teacher here in this room, I just want to say thank you for all of your hard work. A lot of times your work um, isn't really recognized by many and sometimes it goes unnoticed. But if you're an educator teacher and even parents, you're becoming an educator right now in this season. I just want to say something like this, something small. She was just doing it to just care for me as I was trying to navigate change but it had a lifelong impact in my life. And so thank you teachers, educators, and um, yeah, this means a lot. This is a personal story for me. And um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you all. Oh my word, David. I know I was supposed to pop in right after your book reading, but I just, <laughs> I just wanted you to take the full screen. What an incredible treasure that your teacher kind of passed on to you, like even having that binder and having that to even maybe show your kids of, you know, someone that meant so much in your life. I need to ask you, does she have this book? Did you share this book with her? Great question. During the formation of the book, I called a school. I tried to find her online. I did everything. I just couldn't find her anywhere. Um, and um, I'm going to continue uh, that journey. And it's been a couple months. And so I'm going to keep trying until I can find her and send the book. I'm sure everyone right now in this, in this room, like, I don't know if you've seen the chat box, but everyone's like, who is she? She's amazing. <laughs> She's incredible. Remember, this was 25 years ago, middle of nowhere, like middle of nowhere. And um, yeah. I like, yeah. people are like, is someone cutting the onions? I'm crying here. That's so moving. And my goodness, I hope this video goes viral and she somehow comes across this video and <laughs> you're able to find her that way. I think we're all gonna be on a mission to find this teacher for you because that is incredible. And what a testament of, I think the fact that there's like one, I think the fact that she made you feel seen as a Korean American having the Korean translations, but the fact that she posted the Korean in the classroom where your other classmates can see that, I think yeah. that is so powerful as well. So she made her entire classroom messy for a whole year so that I could navigate change well. I mean, I'm tear tearing up again just thinking about that. Um, wow. Yeah, the kind of, yeah, the world needs more of that, uh, for sure. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> that was incredible. And we'll come back. But I think one thing that was very... Um, something that a lot of people resonated with in our audience right now and something that personally resonated with me too was the fact that you included your immigrant story in your book. And this isn't like a Korean book. This is for the general public, but it has Korean words in it and it has your Korean story in it. I'm curious to hear like how important was this to you, especially as you, you know, share this with the publisher. Um, what did you share with them when it came to, because I know you didn't really talk about that specifically in your videos, right? The right. And so this is important because as I was sharing with the publisher, I wanted them to honor my story and my voice. And I'm very grateful that they absolutely were fully on board with that. And um, while change is, uh, you know, it's not an, overstatement to say that 2020 has, it's, it's, can be summed up with change, right? And so anyone and everyone can relate to this word change and all of the parents and kids as they're navigating it. But for uh, the, um, for the immigrant students and families, um, I didn't know this until I started doing this work. 50% of all of children's books, the, the lead main kind of figure is a white male kid and the other 40 percent are animals mm. so for the asian americans where how are we going to relate and how when who's representing us right and so uh i can't really i mean animals are great but i can't relate to animals but i can relate to a korean kid trying to understand and navigate language and so for me um uh, this was important because I wanted to make sure that our voice was represented, our stories, our faces were rep represented as they read about what it means to be a kid. Wow. 
Thank you. Like talk about advocacy for your community and even getting this book out. So thank you for sticking to that <laughs> and saying, I'm going to use this story, you know, that God gave me, which is my immigrant story and allowing so many other people to resonate with it. I don't know if you're looking at the chat box, but people are saying, you know, as military families, this means a lot to them who are constantly moving around um, across the country and around the world. And um, yeah, we need to, we need to get this book out, everyone. This means a lot. And I need to tell you too, like as a former educator and a literacy coordinator, I've come across so many children's books and I've never come across something like this where it's so relevant to the immigrant community, but the language and all the stories, like talk about the food, <laughs> bringing lunch and being embarrassed about that and having to change your name so other people can pronounce it. I know a lot of people have been resonating with that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, David, I know probably in writing this book, it probably taught you something as well. I'm curious to hear what has, you know, writing this book taught you personally? I mean, one thing, I think processing emotions in your family is crucial. And when I say this, I am not trying to bash our Korean American parents and community here. I've I, my father is a Korean American pastor in New York City. Uh, I've worked in the Korean American church almost all of my life. And so I am a big supporter of that. But for the Korean American and Asian American uh, families, um, we're so busy just, you know, trying to make it here that um, we don't even have the language and the tools. It's not that parents didn't want to necessarily. It's just that they don't have the tools. And so uh, just for uh, how important it is, I wish somebody, I wish my parents, and again, they wanted to, they just didn't know how to just ask me, how are you feeling today? Uh, they didn't have those words at that time. And so to process emotions and feelings is absolutely crucial for our journey. Absolutely. And I appreciate that you're also modeling it with us right now, right? Publicly sharing about your story and how much that meant to you as well. And so Definitely agreed. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I think um, obviously there's a lot of, you know, parents tuning in with, um, with their kids, but also dealing with the realities of, you know, spending additional time at home. And you're also a father too, so I know that you could personally speak into this. But I guess the question that I do have is what is um, sort of like, what is your advice to parents who are spending more time with their children in COVID? Is there something that you've been doing, maybe even with this book in particular? Um, how have you been sort of navigating this with uh, Skylar and Zoe in particular? Yeah, so uh, just the other day, Skylar, um, just uh, Skylar and Zoe, I mean, they've been together for the last nine months, every single day, 24 seven. And so uh, she, Skylar just didn't look like happy one day and so again just one of the questions i asked how are you feeling or doing today and so i asked and skylar said no more zoe <laughs> and 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 what she meant and I, I i and she couldn't fully express what she was feeling is that she's like i just want some alone time with mommy right like i just want to be taken care of on my own. And so I just want some private attention, right? So that's what she meant by that. And so just allowing that kind of conversation, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And so we, when we picked that up, we would say, okay, Skylar, today, just you and mommy go out. And she's five and she had the time of her life at Target all by herself. And for her, that meant a lot. And, um, and then when Skylar came back and Zoe was like, no more Skylar and Zoe got her turn. And so I think it's important to create safe places for them to articulate what they're trying to say. I think it's really important. That's so great. And I love how the, the activity was Target. I, I, I guess it's for everyone. I thought it was just for the, the ladies, but I guess for young children, Target has that kind of effect. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure, especially with more than one, one kid in the home too, that's, that adds another dimension of dynamics. But I do appreciate how you really saw them as individuals and not just like, you're, you're a sister. Um, you are also a person and you also deserve time with mommy. I hope they wanted time with you too, David, not just mommy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. That's so great. Um, I do want to, um, something that this book has that's really, really incredible is I think um, before we go right into the Q&A, because we do have some questions, um, 
is how could parents use this book as a conversation starter? And how do you see this book kind of being used? Maybe not just for parents. I could see, you know, therapists using this. Um, yeah, how do you envision this book being used? I think of this book as a bridge. And uh, it's sometimes, I think, for the Korean American parents, it's awkward <laughs> to like just sit down and be like, how are you feeling? And let's pray. It's, it's kind of awkward to kind of get that conversation started. And so when it's a book, it's a wonderful bridge. It's safe. We're not trying to really attack you and put you on a spotlight. We have something where we're coming together and we're using this as a resource to get the conversation started. I think that removes a portion of that awkwardness that we feel in our families. And so I hope that could be a source of, yeah, a source of uh, uh, support and help for not only just parents, but yeah, educators and therapists alike. That's so great. Um, I love that. It's true, because even like watching movies can stir up conversations rather than directly addressing it. That's, it's happening in the home, but that's awesome. Yes. Sharing that. We actually have a question that's sort of tied to the book that's more, I guess, like practically, and maybe um, you could give some advice because you, I'm sure, read this book many, many times. But we have a question around when do you create pauses in the book to talk with the kids, um, or do you wait until the end to talk? Oh, great. Um, so there are a couple great uh, places um, for me. Um, when I talk about I was scared, I think this is an important place for parents or um, yeah, any grownups to just pause and even uh, be vulnerable and share about some of the ways in which, because it, the color changes to black. Mm -hmm. And for me, this, this is an important page. And so I pause here and to really kind of flesh out what I really mean by I was scared, uh, navigating all the change. And so that's a place that I pause often. And and this is another uh, great conversation starter. When I just kind of just fire various different uh, words and descriptions, uh, we can just pause here and say anything that kind of that highlights in in you, and so we can have a conversation there as well. Love that. I love how interactive it is too. <laughs> and it, you literally added questions and sentence stems, which I thought was really, really great. Um, I think as a as educators, I'm sure we could all appreciate that, giving sentence stems for students to kind of begin, um, you know, sharing their emotions. So thank you for that. Um, we have another question here. Um, Someone had asked, do you prefer David or Changhyun today? Ooh, that's a great question. I kind of wish I asked you that in the beginning before just assuming. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. So I, wow, thanks for asking that, whoever that person is. Um, so you would notice that I actually did not put my Korean name, you know? And so I thought about this for a long time. And I decided not to because, not because I'm ashamed, again, I'm not ashamed of my Korean name, Changhyun, but because in my process of embracing change, again, I'm not denying my Korean roots, I decided it's okay to even just be David Kim. And so it took me a while to embrace this name, actually. And so I wanted to fully embrace it and uh, because I had a lot of shame in embracing this. I thought I you know, I, I sold out my Korean American roots and that I, you know, wanted to just, you know, didn't want to be ashamed anymore and various things. And so for me, um, I prefer um, David, um, but I'm open to both, but I decided to just use David Kim. Yeah, thanks for that. I, yeah, I had, I had to go through, a, I had to work through a lot of emotions in that process. And so wow that's a great that's a great question i love what what came out of it too how that is so symbolic as well in your processing as an author i i kind of want to ask like all authors now like why what name did you put and why that's so great i didn't even realize that that was the story behind it so thank you for sharing um this is great we have another question here uh for the embracing change part of the book what is an easy was it an easy transition once you decided to do that um, what was that transition like for you, yourself, as you were personally embracing this change as someone who's gone through this um, immigrant story? Yeah. Honestly, uh, embracing change is not a one-time thing. 
but I think it's embracing changes that we constantly do it over and over again. But as we do it over and over again, I think it does get a little bit easier. I'm not saying all of a sudden it's a magical fix or anything like that, but definitely as I embrace more and more of some of the things that I believe it to be now true of myself, I became more confident in it. And because I was more confident in it, uh, it was easier for me to process. And so, but definitely not a one-time event. Yeah, me. yeah, I definitely agree with that. Definitely, it's not a one-time. You're, you're one and done. We're still processing. And who knows, maybe one day we'll write a book about it too, right? So that's so great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, great, I, uh, let's see, we have some other questions here. Um, Someone had shared that they have an adopted nephew re, uh, reaching his reaching puberty. Is there any resources helpful to him? And I'm also gonna um, share this also with the rest of the group here for anyone tuning in. Uh, we know that we have mental health professionals, we have educators, everyone kind of tuning in. We hope that this is also a space where we can give each other resources. So feel free to share that also in the chat box. But I'm curious to um, David, like could this book even be used for um, students, you know, reaching puberty or um, going into their teen years? Because I know it's seen as a children's book, but to be honest, like I think I got a lot of it out of it. <laughs> it's, I'm still learning the, some of the stuff that I wrote. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> and so um, I, I would say this, um, I would say first and foremost, yeah, even 12, 13 year olds who uh, have read it, uh, they've sent me some notes as well. And so I'm actually meeting a 12 year old next week to talk about some of the things that she's processing. And so that's fascinating. So it's not certainly for when you say kid, you're thinking about like five, six year olds. I think it can, it can be a little bit wider than that, number one. Number two, uh, while there are a lot of great resources and of course, you know, mental health uh, professionals, you guys can speak in to that. But this uh, publisher, A Kid's Book About, that's the publisher's uh, name and they have other books and they've partnered with other specialists to write about that topic. Again, the whole point of this company is to talk about important and difficult conversations that every parent or grown up must have with their children. And so the first book actually last year was on racism. And that's how this publisher really blew up. It's a kid's book about racism. They have a kid's book about anxiety, depression. Um, and um, in the following, they actually have a kid's book about sexual abuse, a kid's book about adoption, uh, a kid's book about immigration. And, uh, and so my book is part of that collection. And so it's not just, I don't wanna just highlight my book, but there are other books that can be even more helpful, particular to your journey as well. That's so great. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, that's so great. Uh, we have another book, um, kind of a question, kind of following up to what you shared about the series. Um, so someone had asked, is the book a part of the series? Yes, it's a part of a, a kid's book about, but from my understanding, there's different authors for each topic, correct? Right, correct. Great. Um, so someone had said, you know, I see other, other books when I typed your book on Amazon. Is there a group discount or sold as a series? There seems to be 26 different books. Which five books would you recommend if we were to buy five books from the collection? First off, I do want to share that you should buy directly from the company uh, because and we'll share a little bit about that later. But I'm going to let you, David, answer that question around. Do you have any recommend other recommendations maybe to bundle with your book? Yeah, um, I've been hearing from the folks and from my publisher, a kid's book about racism, kid's book about belonging is really good, kid's book about empathy. Um, and I've ordered actually for my girl, she's five, and she actually uh, even now is uh, dealing with some anxiety. And so I got her a kid's book about anxiety. And so she's been, she reads it at least once a week. And uh, she's kind of trying to articulate, even at her age, what anxiety is in her, uh, in her language. And so that has been incredibly helpful for us. Um, so anxiety, um, racism, empathy, belonging, and my book. <laughs> <That's>, 
This one. <laughs> That's amazing. And definitely for those who are interested in purchasing, please wait till the end. We're going to actually share a way that you can purchase the book and also support Korean American families. So uh, please hold off <laughs> till the end and stay with us because we have awesome questions along the way. Um, David, this is more of a personal question. How did your girls react when you first read them the book? Like, wow, my dad's an author. How did they react? Um, first of all, when I first brought it, they didn't care. <laughs> like most children, they were playing with their toys. Come on, I got to be honest. And so yeah, they were just like, oh, whatever. And they were playing. And then I think, uh, I think a day later, they took a look and they were like, oh, that's cool. And when they saw their name, I think that's when they really got super excited. Daddy, you wrote a book and you, our names are on it. And so now, uh, I mean, they read it like five, I, I read it almost once a day <laughs> to them. And it's an honor. It's, it's an honor and privilege to come alongside and um and read it and process things with them and i will i'm still learning what that looks like and so yeah absolutely thank you no that's awesome i'm just wondering what it must be like to get a book dedicated to you at such a young age i know that they're definitely going to appreciate it later in life when they're like wow i have a book dedicated to me so that's very precious thank you um we have a uh, another question if a kid is not really wanting to share, but you sense there is something going on, what are some ways to get them to share? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think in my point, I said, you know, we want to respect and honor their boundaries. We want to make sure when they're ready. I We actually made a mistake in one of our earlier parenting. And I know we have, you know, you know, specialists and therapists all in this chat room. So I don't want to overspeak here. But for me, uh, one of the one of the mistakes that we've made is we um, we force them to share and and say something, and we try to you know get things out of them. And I think I think that's just in our uh, Korean blood <laughs> for some reason. And so to kind of pull it out. And so one of the things that we've learned is to just be patient. And if you are a Christian, continue to pray and ask for the right kind of open doors. And whatever that opening looks like, however the the, the spirit of God is uh, moving to see the right timing for that and to kind of poke a little bit to see if there's any kind of opening. Uh, but uh, another thing that has helped is um, one of the parent actually asked, hey, I see that you're going through something and if it's okay that you don't want to talk to me, but uh, I have a specialist who can who do this for a living and and I would love to pay. And, and, and so one parent just did that and, and just messaged me the other day. And so the kid said, yeah. I would love to. And so again, a surprise. I mean, you don't know how they're going to respond. And so now that kid is going to go into uh, her first therapy session. Um, but what a, what a cool way for her to uh, share whatever that's going on inside her. That's awesome. Yeah. And I do. Yeah. You're so right. I think our culture, we're definitely like, let's get it out of you. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes there is beauty. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I know even in teaching, they say uh, the, the, it's like the importance of wait time. Like sometimes there is importance in the silence as well and almost like a letting go and letting them process before share it. sharing so thank you for sharing that um we have a question around if hey david if you don't mind could you share your earliest memories of making friends uh what did those friends do yeah wow um and i'm 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 thinking when i came to america right um, and so uh, my best friend, Paul, uh, I hope he's in this. If not, you're not, you're not a best friend. <laughs> but uh, he was the first person that, um, that I met when I came to America. And he ended up becoming, oh, there he is. And so I'm going to make a shout out to him because he actually ended up becoming, there you go, Paul, um, he ended up actually becoming a uh, kind of a star like jock at, at school, right? He was both the captain of lacrosse and uh, football. And, and so, you know, he had a ton of friends and he was very popular and I barely could speak English. And so I was trying to get by, but a lot of times actually during lunchtime, he would like uh, come and sit with me. And I was usually sitting alone or with somebody else. And so that really meant a lot for me. And so, um, yeah, and since then, we've kept in touch for over 25 years. Um, but yeah, Paul played a significant role in that, making me feel welcome, belong, and seen. 
And, um, you know, definitely in those years, it's not cool for you to leave your inner circle of all of your, you know, football or lacrosse friends, but he did. And um, he spent a ton of time with me. And so grateful for that. Thank you, Paul. Oh, that's, that's all you get. <laughs> Man, th this is great. I love how the questions are segueing into so much more of your life that we get to learn about from your name um, to your friend, Paul. <laughs> Paul wrote, you're welcome now. I can lock up. But um, shout out to Paul and all the friends who are like Paul. I think this is a huge encouragement for us all and a good reminder um, to really, you know, think through who are the people that we can really sit with and be present with and or perhaps virtually in this season. So thank you for sharing that. That's great. Um, I'm going to kind of go through the list a little bit. We do have a question. Um, about um, your role as an Enneagram coach. I know this came up in the chat a little bit earlier when we first introduced it. They're asking, what does that mean? Um, if for people who've never heard of Enneagram coach, how, can you share that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a, a totally, uh, uh, actually it's not different, but basically um, as all of us are trying to figure out who we are and what kind of wirings we have. Um, it's a personality typing uh, system, uh, ancient one. Um, it believes that there are nine different personalities. It's very similar in uh, different ways, similar and different uh, as to like Myers-Briggs and things like that. And um, it, it not only tells you what you do, but it really ex explores why you do what you do. And so it talks a lot about the core motivations and the longings of your heart. And because of that, you live and have patterns in certain ways of being. And so it's a tool for self-discovery that can lead to greater uh, self-awareness and in the way you relate to one another and in organizations and marriage counseling and all sorts of different ways. I know that in recent years in therapy world, a lot of therapists are using Enneagram part of their coaching. And so, and even in churches as well, in churches and organizations. So in Silicon Valley, I use it for teams to better really help each other understand who they are and how to express and communicate and also know their shadow self, but also in churches where as they are being formed into Christ likeness as the mission of the church, like what does that mean individually? Because all, all of our wirings are different, right? And so instead of putting this generic term like, hey, let's just overcome sin, but there are particular sins and habits that you're more prone to than other people. And so it taps really into your particular um, longings and wirings and help you really walk through that. Okay, I said way more than I should have said, but that's a little bit of what Enneagram is. I think it's interesting because I think your interest in Enneagrams, you, you have to think very deeply about how people process, how people interact. And I think it just makes sense that you're an Enneagram coach, but you also wrote this book about how kids can process their emotions. So I think it kind of blends in pretty yes, well. Yes, so yes. Thank you for sharing that. I know a lot of people are actually curious, like, what's an Enneagram coach? So um, in terms of kind of processing, obviously, it's very different for immigrant children and um, and especially as a minority. So we have a great question here around, you know, how might parents help their children who are struggling to embrace their cultural ethnic background as a minority while, you know, trying to integrate with the non-immigrant demographic, which is very much outlined in your book here. Sorry, say that one more time. Sure, uh, so how might parents help children you know, who are struggling to embrace their, you know, cultural ethnic identity as a minority, while also trying to integrate with their, with the, I guess, the host culture. Oh, there you go. Oh, sorry. There you go. I'm, how, okay. I just, I was, how might parents help their children who are struggling to, thank you so much, embrace their cultural ethnic backgrounds as minority while trying to integrate with the non-immigrant uh, demographic? Is, is that the question? Yes. Okay. So, um, I, I think this is um, this is really uh, difficult, um, and um, I don't have I don't have one one sentence answer for this. But one of the ways that's been um, helpful for embracing their background is that I think uh, I think we have to again. I, let me speak because I'm a pastor. I'm going to put on pastor lens. I think it's important that part of the, our culture and our ethnicity is designed by God. And so um, to recognize that it is 
from God and that God has put all of these beautiful things in you. And I'm not saying all of it is great, but that God has orchestrated and, and placed all these things in you. And to embrace that, I think to celebrate that it comes from God. It, I think it's really important to find uh, that to give almost a sense of not this nationalism kind of a thing where there is that kind of pride, but out of this gratitude that this is uniquely given from God and God has somehow designed and orchestrated it. It's an, it, that has helped me almost embrace some of the things that have made me uh, um, shameful or embarrassed of some of the uh, cultural or ethnic backgrounds that I had growing up. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's so great. And it, kind of when you were sharing, I was even just thinking about, you know, the, the affirmations of who you are and how you're uniquely made and even just your teacher um, showing that you matter and that you being Korean is not a deficit, but it's an opportunity for the rest of the classmates to learn Korean as well. I think yeah. just finding those things and drawing that out, I think is wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we do have... <laughs> we got lots of questions. Yeah, lots of questions for you. Um, so we have a question around how can parents have little children uh, who are entering school after having been raised exclusively in Korean culture, so having little or no English, perhaps similar to your background, uh, would you give, how do you really help them? Uh, would you give some specific ideas that would be helpful for them? So this is parents helping children who are entering school, um, similar to the background that you had. Yeah, so one of the things that I found to be incredibly helpful is for the parent to actually just really simply ask and love the, to ask another like American parent to say, can we go on a play date? And for them to interact and to see their culture in a safe place, maybe uh, at a park or I mean COVID, it's hard to do it at home. But things like that, had, uh, I found that to be really helpful. And so my girls, um, yeah, we do that often. And so, and, and they get confused. They're like, why do they say that? Or why are they doing that? But it actually becomes a great conversation starter. And they're in a safe place where they actually ask that to the American parent. Like, and, and so, and, and they are able to really embrace that conversation. And we found that to be, instead of going all the way from zero to a hundred, a one family or two in a park, that, that makes it super, super uh, comfortable and a safe space to navigate those kind of questions for kids to get um, more comfortable with different nuances of the way in which they interact with the world. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh my goodness. We are almost out of time. We have 15 minutes left, but I need to make sure that we definitely hit this question uh, because um, you are launching our webinar series and we are so, so excited that we get to start with, you know, connecting with children and then we'll move on to high school students tomorrow. Um, but obviously you're a very busy person. You have plenty of ways to spend a Monday evening with us. But I'm curious if you could share sort of why you decided to kind of join on uh, with MSG and partner with us in this, um, in our giving campaign and our webinar series. And why is mental health particularly so important as a Korean, Korean American parent? Wow, those are wonderful questions. Number one, I really believe in uh, your work. I pastored in the Korean American church for 11 years, both in youth ministry context. And what I realized and what I saw during that time is that most of our, my kids, anxiety, stress, loneliness, and depression came in regards to their relationship with the parents. And the way in which the Korean American church during those times in the 90s, 2000, and it's getting better. So I don't, I'm not trying to shame or, or criticize the Korean American church. I am for the Korean American church. Uh, again, my father is a pastor in one. And so... Um, what I want to say is that um, a lot of the answers that we heard, even as pastors in seminary, was it was a, a lot of times it was a one dimensional answer to all of our anxiety, depression and loneliness. It's just read the Bible and God, you will figure it out. And um, and what we didn't during that time, what I began to see is that, no, it's actually healthy conversations and relationships and processing emotions and talking about mental health and how and, and having a holistic approach to your healing process, I believe that it's crucial and essential for anyone. And so that's why I, and 
I wanted to partner with you and I believe in what you guys are doing. Well, we're so, so, so grateful to have you. Um, thank you. I know that <laughs> there is so much more to cover. So I am going to share with our audience ways that they can continue to connect with you because I'm sure um, this has led to a lot of more conversations and questions. But I'm actually going to go ahead and share my screen because I know we have a special way to purchase this incredible book but, and also support Korean American families at the same time. So um, I'm gonna kind of announce to everyone here, um, right now you can actually purchase um, David's book by going onto this website. We'll drop the link in our chat box so you can directly go to it. If you purchase through Amazon, it will not work out. So please make sure you go through the company website. It benefits the company as well. So please go ahead and do that. And if you actually use the promo code change msg you will get five dollars off your book which is such a steal because i think this book is worth a lot and um david from what i know the last time i checked there's also a 20 percent off like holiday deal going on right now is that correct yeah and that's because again it's, it's just crazy uh yeah oprah ended up selecting 10 of our the the publisher's collection to be on her favorites list and so in light of that celebration the publisher decided to give 20 percent off of all books until the end of this month and so you're getting 20 percent off and with this code you're going to get another another five percent off five dollars off so it comes down to i think ten dollars or something like that so incredible is this such well, a 96 <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and I, honestly, I think this is, this book is so great, not only for kids, but literally for therapists, for educators, um, for church leaders, ministry leaders. Um, this will be a great book to really start those conversations with kids. And uh, again, a portion of your proceeds, actually, of the proceeds, if you use this code change MSG at checkout, will actually go to support MSG with our programming. So we hope that you can uh, really support our community, uh, support the kids. Uh, by, you, by purchasing the book and use that code um, and that code will go until December 31st. So please share it with everyone, share it with your networks, um, share it with your community leaders, your families, get it for your cute niece or nephew. Um, <laughs> go ahead and do that. I know for sure I'm going to be purchasing a couple more to hand out for Christmas. But And we also uh, wanted to have this webinar go earlier too so that you could get it in time for Christmas. So please feel free to do that. Again, um, I'm going to share with you how you can reach David. You can find him at davidchanghyunkim.com or you could find him on Instagram at davidchanghyunkim and the same thing on Facebook. So there's plenty of ways to contact him about the book, about his uh, Enneagram coaching um, uh, business as well and anything in between. So feel free to reach out to him. So again, David, thank you so much for giving your time on a Monday evening when you have so many roles and duties to play and joining us for the series launch. We're so thankful and honored to have you. Grateful for the opportunity. Thanks for everything that you guys are doing. Appreciate thank you it. so much. Yay, and let's definitely give a big hand to David for sharing the entire book with us too. I was so happy to have it read from by the author himself. Definitely different from reading it on my own. Great, well, I'm gonna share with everyone uh, something very important. Um, we launched our webinar series today. We're gonna continue on with our series throughout the rest of this week at the same time. So tomorrow is a series, um, specifically it's a session for high school students and their parents. So it's an interactive workshop and we're gonna have Jeannie Chang, who's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's going to really go through a workshop around connecting with cultural confidence. Uh, there's a lot of barriers sometimes that we can see to Asian American student success, but specifically, she's going to be talking about how we can break down barriers to Korean American student success. So please uh, join us for that and share it with any high school students in your network in particular. Um, and then after um, tomorrow, so on Wednesday, we'll have a career panel uh, joined with us 
five different uh, mental health professionals. We have um, a counselor, we have a former school counselor, we have a social worker, we have um, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. So for college and grad students, if you are curious about the mental health field, please join us. There's gonna be a time for Q&A as well. So you can ask all the questions and ask for all the advice. Um, I think it's awesome to see representation from the Korean American community um, being represented on our panel. And then on Thursday, for our church and community leaders out there, we have four amazing leaders from across the U.S. joining us to sh joining us to really share uh, really creative ways that they've been able to um, connect their churches to mental health, ways that they were able to address mental health in their communities. And so, please join us. You're going to learn so much from each one of them. Uh, we have we have uh, speakers from Pennsylvania, from uh, Illinois from New Jersey and California and so literally from coast to coast you get to hear from them and then lastly we'll have a bilingual presentation by our very own founder of MSG Dr. Josephine Kim and she'll be speaking in both Korean and English and there will be a time of Q&A and this is really about bridging the cultural gap between Korean immigrant parents and their Korean American children. I know we touched a little bit about it even in reading this book together but um, we're so excited to have her close out the week for us. So please join us. Again, every uh, session is going to be um, translated as well. So please uh, tune in with both parent and child. We hope everyone can tune in together. So with that said, um, I want to highlight our fundraising campaign. So this webinar series is really launching our MSG 20K for 2020 fundraising campaign. Our mission is to really create spaces like this, like we did tonight, to really educate our families, to empower our mental health professionals who are working on the ground, and to really equip our church and community leaders. We are raising 20,000 by the end of December, by the end of this year, so that we could create more resources, create more online webinars, be able to host a national summit um, this upcoming year, which we were able to do for the first time this year, to great response. We want to do that again next year, as well as a really expand our online directory of mental health professionals so that our Korean American community can get access to these resources. And lastly, to equip our church and community leaders with mental health first aid training so that they are able to identify risk and refer out uh, people as needed and also know the appropriate steps to navigate these tricky situations when it comes to mental health. So we really, really hope that you can join us. I'm excited to share a progress update. Um, we did a soft launch and we already raised $4,209. I'm gonna give a huge shout out to our community who's been really pouring in and giving us so much love, some of you are listening right now. Thank you so much for your donations and for your love and support. We do have $15,791 left to go and we have 17 days left. So if you are tuning in and you really enjoyed today's webinar, please purchase the book, please donate or spread the word for our campaign right now in the chat box. You'll see two links, uh, one for our fundraising campaign, which you can uh, click to donate. And we will also have a webinar survey link that we're dropping because we would love to hear uh, your feedback on any potential future webinars that you would like to see happening, any questions or people that you wanna see um, coming into our webinars, but also feedback on how today's webinar went so that we can continue to uh, provide content that is relevant and helpful for you all. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, to continue to support our work, you can use that QR code. You literally just pull your uh, phone up and just show the camera on that QR code and you'll be directed to our uh, fundraising page or you could actually text MSG to 844-844-6844. So you could literally text MSG to that number and you'll be sent directly to our fundraising link. We really hope that you can join us. Uh, we know that this work is really needed. And I think as today's webinar showed, we need to have more of these conversations on, on how to really support our and educate our families to really equip our leaders as well as empower our mental health professionals. So thank you again for tuning in tonight. We hope to see you again tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you so much. Bye everyone. <laughs>